pests in your garden are, and pests being disease and insects, they're the predators of the plant world. They're like the wolves in, you know, and or the coyotes to the deer. And they're just part of the system. And so when you raise a garden, you're not the only one that's going to want to eat this food. There's something else out there. And they're not doing anything wrong. They're just trying to stay alive and make, make babies, have <laughs> a family. And, but just like people, the foundation of a good immune system in a person is good food and being raised, you know, in a healthy environment. <clears throat> and so in the plant world, it's really not any different. And so us as all gardeners, what we want to do is feed our plants good food, raise a healthy plant, um, give it the immune system necessary to be able to fight off most of those diseases and, uh, and to withstand um, because most insects aren't there for the whole time. They, they come at certain stages. So <clears throat> when you're starting with a seed and raising a transplant, you want, it, you want that growth curve just like you would for a child. Steady, steady up. No plateaus because every time you get a plateau, you, you impinge on the potential of, of the person or the plant. And so you want to have good soil because plants don't have stomachs. So you, ne you shouldn't feed plants. We all tend to do it a little bit. I, I'll miss with fish and seaweed, I'll, which would be a, a foliar feed. But the best food is to let them make their own nutritional choices. So in my perspective on growing plants, and I def always defer to Mother Nature because she's been doing it a lot longer than all of us put together have, is <clears throat> let the plants make their own nutritional decisions. Create the foundation, build the soil, feed the microbes first, let them decide what they're going to eat and when they're going to eat it. That puts a, a, a fair amount of responsibility on understanding exactly what a good source of nutrition is in the food. But then, you know, and especially you as being a dairy farmer, you have seen even raising dairy animals and you used manure in your garden and that black dirt and plants grow faster because they have the ability to take out all those nutrients that have been passed through this circle, this circle of life. And most of the time, they can get through an insect infestation. You talked earlier about squash bugs and how <clears throat> that's an infestation. When they come, they can really decimate. Um, and they have a lot of babies. When you only have a few plants, if you're on top of it, you look for their eggs. You're always turning over the leaves. Um, and then you, you squish them. And squash bugs especially, and even in your house or in your garage um, in the wintertime, because they overwinter. The adults overwinter. And then they come out at certain degree days. But they're overwintering. And then they'll leave their their wintered site, but you know the smell, how they smell that kind of squash bugs smell like almost like a perfume. Jeffrey, what, what would you say that smells like? It's got a very distinct odor. I can tell if there was a squash bug overwintering in this room, and I'll track it down. <laughs> because if you can, if you can, um, and and that would be another major piece of, of dealing with pests. Healthy plant, that's one part of it. 
having a good immune system, good fertilizer in your soil, everything that it needs, understanding what pH it wants, and raising a really healthy uh, plant with a solid immune system. But then also understanding, not you, but what else would want to eat this? What are their pests? And then learning about those pests and how, and learning about those pests and what is their life cycle and what is their most vulnerable part of that life cycle so that with the least amount of energy you could interrupt that life cycle and break that chain. And so obviously if you can trap the overwintering bugs on, on a dairy farm, what comes out first time in the spring, a lot of flies. And I use, like here, I have, uh, I have hogs and I have chickens. And so I, what I try to do is I have these, you know, those little bottles that you use all the scent in. If I catch the breeders in the spring, I don't have to fight them all summer. I used to have one of those bottles. Yeah, they really work. Oh. And then fly strips, early, early on fly strips. And then, um, so with, with the squash bugs, getting those breeders, and they will come out, and you will, if, if, early on, and if you use sticky, sticky tape next to your plants, you can potentially get the breeders. Every, they're gonna, that means you, you've skilled a lot of eggs <laughs> without even squishing eggs. Um, and uh, squash bugs are really tough. Uh, adults are really tough. In organic, there is not much. We can use a, a botanical, um, a pyrethrum-based, um, pyreth, uh, py, uh, pyganic would be the organic version. Oh, here's Newman. <laughs> uh, or, you know, this pyrethrum. And that, that's a contact poison. I try not to use it at all because, um, come on, come on up here. Come on up here. There you go. Get comfortable. And um, because it's broad spectrum, it kills everything. It kills the good guys, the bad guys. It kills the bees. It kills everything. So that is like waging war. You do not want to get to the point where you're waging war. That would be typical conventional agriculture, industrial ag. It's where it's a cross between a war and a mining operation. And this is relatively new, and I know I've spoken to you about it. BBC just came out. Um, the, the British have been carrying on this agricultural um, testing for over 150 years, from 1950 until this year. The nutritional food of produce has dropped the same produce, whether it's broccoli or you know cabbage or whatever, has dropped 38 percent. 38 percent. What is 1950? Post World War II, when we started using NPK, not putting on manures, not doing the, the not that management system that all the old timers used to do. We all were out there, growing, tending working and now it's like a schedule and so it's chemicals chemical fertilizers and it works i've you can spray and you can kill something there's no doubt about it but what is the when you unbalance the system now you're going to have more insects you're going to have more disease and um so trying to make a healthy plant give it all the food that it, that it needs, giving it the right to choose its own nutritional base, knowing what other animals would come out and want to eat it, understanding their life cycles, um, using soft, using botanicals uh, like neem, um, un basically, and so this, you had issue and you thought it was uh, vine borers, but you weren't really sure. 
that also with two squash, <coughs> um, it, by collapsing um, and looking like it, it's wilted, could be, um, oh, um, bacterial wilt. And, and so that's a disease, but that's a disease that has an intermediate host because it can't, it doesn't overwinter. And striped cucumber beetles, which we're all familiar with, that bacteria lives over the winter in the striped cucumber beetle that goes in the ground and hibernates for the winter, just like a squash bug would overwinter. Now what I do on striped cucumber beetles is I check degree days because nature is this amazing thing. It has this dance where everything has to be attached and function together because it is, everything is eating something else. So um, that, that cycle breaks down if, if they emerge too soon or too late. So the dance is when those degree days are accumulated for the striped cucumber beetle, its host's plants are up and ready to eat. And if that wasn't the case, think of caterpillars in a tree. If the caterpillars came out and there were no leaves on the trees, they're done. So the leaves always emerge at a, at a shorter heat threshold, degree days, than the caterpillars. And so you want to deal with pests, understand that system, that cycle. And then you don't have to have a war. And sometimes you do need to uh, be very attentive and go out and we have, um, oh, and you said you use BT. Awesome for certain things. Neem, awesome for certain things. We use a, a bacteria, um, which is, is the, that bacteria is spinosad. Spinosad. And that is a very, you can't mix neem and spinosad together, but you can alternate the use of spinosad and neem so that your insects which have a very rapid lifestyle, will not get used to the same thing. And so they won't build up that immunity. So it's important to basically find out what works and what else works and always mix it up. And on a home gardener, the best thing to do, go out there in the morning, in the evening, walk, become part of your garden, uh, an old organic adage was the best fertilizer is a farmer's footsteps. Become part of the system, not apart from the system. You will, there is a thing called ancient knowledge, which you will be able to sense what's going on if you're just always part of it and seeing those little minute changes that happen. Then you'll know and you'll be able to act in time like even like powdery mildew and things like that, which is, how are you doing with powdery mildew? <laughs> Don, we've been able to, we, we've been as bad a season as this is. I have plants that I know, um, oh, what, what is the one? Um, lilacs, they're one of the first plants to show powdery mildew. And it, when I walk out past my lilacs, I'm like, uh-oh, I better get out there. And neem is very effective. And so trying to catch up on it after you got it, trying to catch up on squash bugs or cucumber beetle infestations after they have established is, is really hard. So being on top of it, n knowing when they're going to emerge, knowing when they're going to come, dealing with them then. If I was going to use something like pyrethrum, I would use it specifically for emergence when I know a, partic a particular pest is coming out. Because usually 
the bees aren't as active and you can hammer them. And always, you will never get emergence of your striped cucumber beetles or your squash bugs in the middle of the field. They will always be on the edge. They'll, and they're usually, if you've got a hedgerow or something or shrubs, and then, then you've got your little walkway, and then you've got your crops, put your attention right there at the beginning. Because that's when they emerge, they're going to be emerging from that leaf litter and all that stuff on the edge of the, on the, edge of the field. And if, if you're conscious and aware, you can really um, help your plants out a lot more by catching anything early and not let it get away from you. Um, you know, and <clears throat> with, we've got a couple of, we have raspberries, and now we have, and, and there's always gonna be new pests, so you're always updating your knowledge and understanding what's happening. And I don't know the degree days on the spotted wing Drosophilus. That is a fruit fly that attacks soft fruits, blueberries, raspberries, peaches, grapes, things like that. So what I do is I check the EDU sites and they have it when it's arriving in Massachusetts, when it's arriving in Albany, when it's in Bennington. And then, then it's like, okay, it's here. And then, um, and that's one that one of the only things an organic grower can use is spinosad, and that's that bacteria. But then you need the cultural adaptations that go along with it. Raspberries are really dense. So what you have to do is prune so hard because they hide out in the center of the bush. And the only way that spinosad is gonna work is if it touches them. And so you need to really open up that plant canopy, be able to spray with some sort of force. Most backyard gardeners have anywhere from a spritzer bottle to a hand pump. Um, and, but if you had, um, I have what would be like a leaf blower that also has a tank on it that gives liquid so it's under pressure. I can get that, that spray through. Um, and that also helps with your powdery mildew, your, um, oh, all the different fungal diseases, early blight. And, and the same thing with, with like early blight, um, knowing when it's gonna come, when that's what I was talking about with that yeah. But am I going to have trouble with it next year? Most likely, yes, because it's soil borne, and usually once you got it, you got it. And if you, especially in a small area, and even, you know, I have a big area, and I move things around. I have this crazy rotation root, fruit, leaf, you know, so they, because different plants eat different nutrients. So you, rather than putting out the same thing that just sucks up nitrogen or needs nitrogen, if you can move it around, um, and, and like you plant your beans, which nitrogen fixes, and then the next year you want to try to get your lettuce there because they're nitrogen eaters. And so you're always trying to figure that out. It doesn't always work out um, because sometimes the only piece of ground that's dry enough to put your early stuff in is where it was last year. So, um, but yeah, um, once you got it, and, and even with my rotation, I have a rototiller. I have tractor, I have tires. It moves that stuff around oh, yeah, once you got it. Too. Yeah, so you move it from A to B. It's sort of like that, you know, with the, 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 the invasives in the lakes. Take your boat out, move it here. Now you got it in the air. Just keep spreading. Same thing with a lot of these fungals that overwinter. Now something like late blight does not overwinter here. So and what am I gonna do next year to prevent? Preventative. So um, hydrogen peroxide, actually dairy farm, raw milk, raw milk with water. I can't remember the exact um, proportion because raw milk has not been adulterated and killed. <laughs> so it has all the proteins and enzymes together. 
which actually fight off and create an inhospitable environment for the fungus to attach because there's too much competition going on. And guess what? I was, you were brought up on raw milk. I was brought up on raw milk. It's good. <laughs> so it's not going to hurt anything. If you use the hydrogen peroxide, do you dilute it? Yes. You get 3% hydrogen peroxide. I think it's not, uh, 9 to 1. And baking soda, also really good. 9, nine, nine parts water to 1 part. part yeah. And, and then you can do... Um, Oh, with that, we use the neem, um, which is really good. Um, oh, I'm drawing a blank, but um, the biggest thing is getting that, getting a, a copper, sulfur, and all of those, well, the, the, um, and you rotate. And you wrote, yeah, try to use different things. Try not to always use the same thing. But you have to coat the leaf surface well, not just, bo not just the top, because a lot of the splashback is coming from underneath. So you need to really, you need to cover your plant. And you need to start before it's there. Because trying to play catch up as a curative is really hard. There's not much. There are a few things out there, like hydrogen dioxide, um, which is, is a little bit more stable than hydrogen peroxide. But it's hard to get. Um, and that actually, at a, at a 10 to 1, one part to 10 parts water, can actually be a curative. And the way that works is that when you apply it, to the leaf surface, even with fungus spores on there, um, and similar to hydrogen peroxide, that chemical change creates heat and ruptures the fungus spores. But the best way is to prevent it from getting there in the first place. And that means just going out, and that's once again with the, the you know, going out in the morning and the evening with a cup of coffee, after it rains, um, spray your plants um, and and try to stay ahead of it because once it gets hold, once it gets a hold, we're talking fungus. There's a lot of them. <laughs> Just, they're everywhere. Mm -hmm. And so really trying your best to um, understand those life cycles, be it disease or be it insect. And that's fun because it's almost like um, just pick something up. And especially now with, I don't, I. I have one of these, a smartphone. It's a lot smarter than I am. And I use it in a, in a bizarre way. I'm on the EDU sites, Cornell University, um, Amherst. Um, I'm always looking for, um, I have plant identification. I can take a picture of something, uh, but that doesn't always work because there's so many funguses and things look so, and do not hesitate if you've got something that is troublesome, that you want to learn about, put it in an envelope, send it up to the pathology, plant pathology department at UVM. They'll tell you what it is. And that's knowledge. And that's what we need as growers is to better understand this system that we've been removed from for, for generations and reacquire that ancient knowledge that, oh boy, a lot of the old timers, they had it down. They, you know, it's things that were passed down generation to generation. It's like recipes and, a how, and you know, good food, that cultural piece. And you guys, farm family. But, you know, I, I don't, I, I unfortunately did not have, I had my grandma, but I didn't have that built in into me. So it's, it's I'm always trying to learn stuff. And I think it's so amazing because, um, you see how all of this, these relationships all kind of connect. And, and I view myself, and, and I always say this, is these, are my, these plants are my children. And, uh, and just like having a child, it's, it, it's your responsibility to protect them. I mean, you've pushed the seed in the ground. Oftentimes, this plant doesn't even belong growing in Vermont. We grow trees. That's what Vermont is. 
northern hardwood forest. And now we've got eggplants and, <laughs> and peppers tropicals and all these different things here. And, um, and then, then we're wondering why something's going wrong. Because it's, you brought it here, you're planting it, you want to eat it, but figure out what's, what, it, what it needs and provide it what it needs and it'll provide what you want. Then that's the relationship. Unfortunately, we always have this one-sided thing. It's like, how come it's not, you know, and then we, it's easy to blame the weather on a year like this. Um, but it's so weird, especially in a year like this, like I said early on, the biggest pest in our garden this year are mosquitoes because we can't even function out there. Um, but last year, that was so hot and dry, eggplants are one of our um, cash crops that we grow and sell wholesale. Oh, it was too dry. It was too dry. Too hot. A tropical plant like eggplant is dropping its flowers when it's sunny and hot. This year, I, I think this is the best eggplant year I've ever had in 40 some odd years. And I'm like, and it won't stop raining. Peppers, peppers that look like, um, I must have used miracle Grow or something. The things are crazy. And then that's another very similar to, to to eggplants that's a tropical plant and you go wow these things really like water and obviously they don't need a lot of sun because all we've had is cloudy rainy weather there's something out there are you running something uh, burn pile. oh it's a uh, gay uh, we have a burn pile out there my wife is gay likes everything clean <laughs> I just wanted to be yeah. sure that it wasn't burning yeah. something that wasn't I heard something. I was wondering what it was. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so every year is different. The pests this year um, are um, manageable. One, a year like this, no aphids. We haven't had any aphids. Last year, a lot of aphids. So a lot of that stuff is, and aphids are, what an amazing, what an amazing insect, born pregnant. What a, what a way to succeed. <laughs> it's like unbelievable. Um, and um, it wants to, and same thing. Boy, if you don't catch them early, trying to play catch, catch up with aphids is so. And then thinking of all of these insects, like corn borers and things um, that don't, that aren't here. They're not here in the winter, they don't over, and then all of a sudden um, they arrive. And they arrive on low pressure systems that come from the south, and that's what late blight does. It, is, it comes up on weather systems, and, and then it falls from the sky in, in rain, or if like the, the, um, the corn borer, they're like up there in the, in the upper atmosphere in the clouds, and when they go over and they, there's corn below, they pick up the signals of the corn. And then it's like uh, dive bombers coming down because they need to eat. And being aware and, of that and watching these systems is also, once again, it's amazing that you become part of this, this greater whole. And um, even though you don't always get everything you want, you can usually acquire knowledge or after a while. Um, you can keep things sorted together. And then you do some day, some years you just lose. I mean, we've had, what well, we've had infestations of squash bugs because there's not much. If we don't catch them when they're young, really young and interrupt their life cycle, they're bulletproof. Once they're those those little armored beetles, they're, you're done. And then, if you don't get out there and pull every plant and get rid of that, that's next year's bugs right there. So it's cleaning up at the end of the year. That goes for 
that goes for insects and disease. And, um, and I'm guilty of that because I have too many children. My family is too large and, and I'm always pushing the envelope because I make my living growing plants and selling food. And um, I'm pushing the envelope. I'm always trying to grow things as long as I possibly can. I'm covering everything up saying, oh, if I can get through this frost, I can still sell eggplants and tomatoes. And, and my wife, Gay, is like, let it go. Will you just please let it go? <laughs> you know, why do you want to do this? And, and as a result, I might get a, a few extra really good farmer's markets at the end of the year. But then I might have shot myself in the foot by not being able to clean up everything, um, get it in the compost, get it burned, whatever it has to be done, and then leaving it out there. And then that's where my problems lie from the next year, so even just trying to rotate out. So. You touched upon a couple things that I want to circle back on and make sure that you describe because they're important things. And there's also another thing that I want you to talk about that I think is very unique that you do. Um, so the first one is if you can explain the difference between something like a pyganic or the pyrethrin and the neem, so the contact killer and the growth inhibitor. Yeah. And then if you can describe, because you're very meticulous about this, about the timing in which you spray things and how you, how and what you mix, because you don't just do one thing. Yeah. So, so can, you, do, can you talk about those two things? Sure. So, you know, in, in our, there's botanicals, biologicals, um, and, um, that's pretty pretty much the classification, the two main ones. And um, the pyrethrum, which is a botanical from African daisy, is is really poison. It kills insects, good, bad, and indifferent. And that is the thing that you would not pull out unless the crop is in danger. And that you believe that you're gonna do you're gonna you're you're gonna do more good with that spray than you're gonna do harm. Because every garden has beneficials. Lots of beneficials. And you're trying to aid them and not eliminate them. So something like pyrethrum should be used with extreme caution because you may end up in the long run do more harm than good. Um, you, can, you spray, if you're going to spray pyrethrum, you have to make sure we have like 25 hives, beehives on this land. And we have an amazing amount of diversity that we've grown up over the years. We have pollinators, we have all of these different ecosystems trying, permaculture, just really trying to balance out the land so it can, it's an ecosystem. And, um, and having it function in a, in, a, in a cycle that keeps on, that is more sustainable. And something like pyrethrum, if used improperly, upsets the entire system. And then you will have more problems with infestations as you continue. Now you take neem, which is another botanical, but it's from the neem tree in India. Uh, it really, it, it, it's a growth interrupter stage for certain insects, 
and squash bugs is one of them, when they're little. When they're little, they're more like a, a baby. They're, they're at risk. They haven't developed that, that, it, that ability to fend off anything like the adult squash bug can. And, um, and then you have um, spinosad, which is a bacteria that doesn't touch aphids at all, but it also acts like an interrupter that can um, intercede, interject itself in that life cycle stage and prevent uh, like Colorado potato beetle. It's amazing. And so with spinosad, we would use that. We, we know we have Colorado potato beetles. You start to see them. And they're a little tough. They, they overwinter also. They come up. We try to time our spray so that when those eggs that they're laying get dark just before they hatch, or when they're just starting to hatch, some of them, if you go out and you spray the spinosad or BT, Bacillus, Bacillus thuringiensis, that's when you time it. That's when you, you, you know, and they have to actually physically eat the leaf to ingest it for that, to have the, the dire consequences on them. It messes up their, their digestive system. Neem, the same thing, they eat it and it doesn't kill them. They're just not eaten. So you still see the bugs. Um, and that's troublesome for a lot of people <laughs> because we're used to, I spray, they die, I'm happy. <laughs> and here, there's a lag. But, and this year was really amazing because um, I have a 27-year-old son and we have a, we had an older sprayer. It kind of was like old things, kind of worn out. And now we got a new one. And this year, as we all know, the weather was not conducive to doing any, hardly any spraying because you don't need to, it's a, it's, it's a waste of time and energy and, and, and it's very ineffective to spray and then have it rain. All of these, all of these organic things are so um, temporary in their ability. Uh, to affect any change in the insect or the or the or the um, the diseases, that timing of the spray is absolutely critical. And we found just enough windows to be able to go out and um, and spray under pressure. One of the things that's nice about those backpack sprayers um, is y you don't use much neem or much spinosad at all. It's atomized and sprayed in a mist where when you have the little push sprayer or your spritzer, it's water droplets and this is just mist. And so it's very efficient. Um, you, you don't have to hit a, hit a bug with a lot of it or, or just coat the leaves for them to eat it. And we just found those windows and it's pretty amazing. I, I, I was intending to walk through the garden with this thing and show, um, and we've managed to keep, we have, we have our first crop, our first plant. Typically we do two or three plantings of zucchini, cucumbers, things like that, because they get played out. And also um, the, the, the plants, mom is tired, she's had too many children, weak, now she's susceptible to disease, to insects. So you always move into that next planting. And then you have those beautiful straight cucumbers and you got a bountiful supply of these beautiful little winter squash, uh, summer squash. And, and this year, because of the weather, we could not get those successive plantings in because we, it was, we had standing water. And, but we did find little windows of opportunity almost every week to go out and spray um, for powdery mildew 
um, with neem, which is amazing stuff. It just, it's also, it not only does insects, but it also does, does um, a certain amount of fungus control. And um, kept everything under control from cucumber beetles to baby squash bugs to, um, and I'm naming some of the ones that are our biggest ones. Typically it would be aphids, but this year there were just no aphids. We didn't have to do anything about them. And you use neem for those? I use neem, and then I also use um, spinosad. And spino, spinosad, S-P-I-N, spina. Sad. A S A D S S A D. It's been a sad, and uh, it's an amazing thing. It was actually a um, a chemist that worked for Dow. It was on vacation in like the Caribbean. I think it was Jamaica, and he just happened to be walking past, you know, uh, a a compost pile and saw some really weird stuff happening, and he actually took a sample and brought it back, and that's how Spinosad. And so Dow is not one of my favorite companies, but this is a really good, really good oh, product. this is made by Dow? Dow Chemical, yeah. And it's very expensive, but it's very effective. And then a thing that you should always use is some sort of uh, safer soap is amazing stuff. Safer That's soap? what Safer soap. S-A-S-A-S-A-S. S-A, S-A, yes, yeah. And it, it's... Uh, that's great for aphids and, and, and th um, thrips and um, mites, spider mites and things like that. Um, and I always add a sticker spreader, which is some kind of just a natural soap in, into my solution. You, because you put that... You like the safer soap into the name? I do, I use safer soap and neem together. It works great. And the oil, when you, when you use soap, it is, once again, it breaks down the oil into smaller particles. So it's more effective in the spray. And this, the soap makes it stick. So What's it's not, and especially you, if you've ever grown kale and things like that, if you had aphids on kale, and you spray whatever, and it's just water, it, it just beads up and runs off the plant. And then you have no carryover. It's not, you know, the insect. And so we'll, we'll, like a lot of the times, what we use that, because the cabbage moth loves kale and loves all those broccolis and things like that. And the neem is just so effective. But then we'll, we'll and sometimes we'll put the BT right in with the neem. So and then. Oh, um, you know, they all have, um, I think the neem is three teaspoons per gallon of water. And I don't remember what the safer soap oh, is, so but you, you basically use, follow the, follow the directions that are on the label and don't use more. <laughs> more is not better. <laughs> uh, use what's effective. Um, and then... And then, then mix it up. So if you're doing, if you're doing neem, the next time you spray, um, do the spinosad. And, and if you if you really, um, or or just safer soap, so that they don't have a chance to really get used to uh, to and build up an immunity against. The, that's always my greatest fear. Is we have some pretty good. Um, products out there that people have really, you know, neem has been for thousands of years, the Indians have, you know, folks in India use that and it's been phenomenal. Um, and we don't want to um, breed resistance mm -hmm. and, and be able to, that's, that would be, that would really hurt. Um, is that good? What, you add some other things into your mixes. Oh, I do. Uh, oh, one of the greatest pests that we have is four-legged kind, deer. And actually, I, I, six eggs, old eggs, rotten eggs, or, or new eggs, 
in five gallons of water and um, a, um, a sheetrock um, drill that you mix sheetrock mud up with and just spin it up, get it nice, and just leave it with the top on. Dogs love it, so you want to <laughs> make sure it's covered. It gets pretty stinky. And that, I guarantee you, is amazingly effective against deer. I have tried Irish Spring Soap. I have tried coyote urine. I have gone and collected human hair from barber shops. I have done electric fence with aluminum foil baited with peanut butter. I have done radios in the garden. I have done um, motion sensor lights. Um, I am sure you guys have a great deer population over there. Because my garden is right in front of the house, the deer don't come there. If I didn't have an electric fence, I would have woodchucks. Yeah. They, they won't eat tomatoes, but they would eat anything. Oh, they love, the yeah. They, you know what the best thing for woodchucks are? amazing somebody told me this and I used it and actually they were eating my broccoli and I I almost guffawed at it and then I was like ah, what do I got to lose find their holes both of them because they usually have two and you fill their holes with dirty kitty litter <laughs> and then they go this neighborhood sucks and they leave and it really, really works. It's amazing. But um, spraying, and so when I do my sprays, uh, instead of water, oftentimes I'm mixing that, that rotten egg in it. And um, you, can, you can smell it when it's liquid, but after it dries, and, uh, and if you get it on so it's dry before rain comes, that stuff lasts for weeks. And the deer, that love beans, uh, carrot tops, beets, no damage. It's pretty, pretty amazing. And then what you were saying with that, um, and that actually uh, I'm trying to remember um, who came up with this, but mixing several of the, the sprays together, you get the synergistic quality. So if you're going to do the Piganic, you would, use, you would also use neem. You could use the safer soap. You could use the, um, the, the eggs. And, and then um, it really is, it's, it is better than spraying each one singularly. And, um, and I, I just, I love it because it's every year I'm always trying to learn something new about um, how how to make things work better, and and you know, and it is. It's one of these things. It's um, I'm always I always feel responsible because I have I'm, these are my my plants, and a, one of the best things you can do if you raise your own seedlings, make sure. They're big and they're healthy. And that growth curve, just like a child, is going straight up. It plateaus when it's mature and going to give fruit. If it plateaus earlier, your yield just gets, gets cut way down. And take soil samples. They're not, they are by no means, in my opinion, this panacea. It is, it is an art and a science combined. We don't know, we think we know. You can send a soil sample to several different places and you'll get different recommendations. They're not perfect. But if you do them on a periodic basis, they give you an indication of whether the soil is getting better or worse. And then knowing which plants, like blueberries, knowing that the soil needs to be acid, knowing which ones just want, a, most, most vegetable plants want just a little acidic. 
because then the, the, the nutrients can be extracted more easily. But paying attention most to the soil before you do anything else is the most critical piece in having that, that rich environment. And, uh, and Jeffrey's heard this, and it's true. Fourth grade science, pick up a teaspoon of soil. There's more living organisms in that teaspoon of soil than there are people living on the planet. Don't mess it up by killing it with chemicals. Feed it. The microbes eat first. And if you have that soil just bubbling with everything, that e a, an incredibly healthy ecosystem, the plants will have everything they need. And it's like, we, it's like what we used to have a farm stand and we would raise these beautiful plants just with organic soil and no miracle grow and everything. And then people would come in and they'd go, oh, I want those trailing petunias. And I go, yeah, where are you going to put them? I got this great place by my deck on the north side of the house. And I go, you can't have these because they want full sun. And it's like, just be, you, they don't do what you want them to do unless they're where they need to be. And, and it, Gay, doing the, the mail, this is true. She would, we did the hanging bags. You ever see the bags? The wave petunias in the bags, they were freaking gorgeous. And then people would get them and they don't know how to water them because it's a whole different thing. And Gay would pick them up on, the, on her mail route, bring them back, and then We'd bring her a new one, and then we'd nurse the old one back. And it was like, wow, people don't mind killing plants. <laughs> and uh, so it's, it's, it's a relationship. That, that, the takeaway, it's a relationship. It's, it's you being a parent raising children, and it's, you, it's up to you to understand what your children need and supply them. And then one of those responsibilities is understanding what the risks are to your children out there and then learning those life cycles also. And it just becomes this web that you begin to understand how everything works together. And you're just one part of it. And unfortunately, though, most of us think we're the, we're the center of the universe again. And that's how we get in trouble.